So starting out with the uh, model of star formation and our evidence for it, I guess the key thing to know is that stars form from molecular clouds, which we talked about last time being a, you know, cold uh, 10 to 20 Kelvin uh, area of space where uh, the gas is no longer in its individual atomic form, but has actually joined up into larger and heavier molecules. These are often, you know, full of dust. We know that they must be very dusty and that's what protects those molecules from the UV radiation from nearby stars that would otherwise uh, break those molecules apart. So these are the coldest, densest regions of um, the interstellar medium. And these are the, you know, birthplace of stars. So small chunks of these, um, first they're called clumps and then they're called cores as they get smaller and closer to forming a protostar. Um, and they're basically just little fragments of these molecular clouds um, that collapse into stars. And the entire process is basically governed by the concept of hydrostatic equilibrium, which we discussed when we talked about the sun and how it stays stable over time. So in hydrostatic equilibrium, you have gravity pushing in, uh, the pressure of material pushing out, and those things will uh, you know, change the size of an object until those two forces come into balance. And so for our protostar, uh, gravity has to be beating the pressure uh, in order to shrink and heat the very cold molecular cloud uh, clump into a hot protostar and then eventually into a star. So this is the overall um, star formation model. We'll come back to these four stages. So I just want to give each of these a uh, name specifically so that we can refer back to it. Um, the first stage is when some a uh, clump in a interstellar or molecular cloud collapses. So these uh, little chunks here shown in this image are supposed to be small clumps inside a much larger molecular cloud. And those clumps are collapsing under their own gravity. So the system when it starts out is quite large, much larger um, on the order of 100 times larger than our own solar system. After it begins to collapse, um, it starts to get smaller, of course, because it's collapsing. That heats up the entire system and it causes it to spin faster and faster. So this is the beginning of our protostar structure. At this point, it's still surrounded by a sort of haze, an envelope of material. And that material continues to fall onto the protostar for the rest of its formation process. Eventually, um, the protostar starts to form strong winds that push material away from its polar regions. And this is called the T tori phase. Um, it doesn't apply to all protostars, but it applies to many. And then finally, at the very end, what you end up with when nuclear fusion begins is a star. So the star is different than a non-star because a star has nuclear fusion in its core. And when this process is done, the um, star itself is not necessarily completely finished shrinking. It um, still has some ways to go before it reaches the main sequence. Um, and so the star itself can be on the order of 100 AU, which is a bit bigger than our, uh, well, on the order of size of our solar system. And it still has a disk of uh, gas and dust around it. And it's from this disk that planets can form. All right, so this is the overarching model. And um, I wanna point out here that I don't have any of the time scales labeled on this diagram. Um, but this initial collapse phase takes only thousands of years. So this is the fast piece. And then the, the subsequent evolution to the main sequence can take millions of years. So it's really hard to observe this really fast collapse because not very many stars are forming at any given time in the first place. And since this collapse happens so quickly on an astronomical time scale, then it's just unlikely that we're going to find um, evidence of this process directly. So it can be difficult to find specific observational evidence that perfectly corresponds with each phase of this model. Um, but luckily there's enough space out there that we have um, enough observational evidence to say that this star formation model is something we can be fairly confident in. All right, so starting out with this process of collapse, I wanna ask you a question about this collapse. So um, what needs to happen in order to form a star? All right, so remember gravity is the force that's pushing in 
um, pulling all the mass toward one another. It's an attractive force between objects with mass. Um, pressure is the force that's pushing out. So the pressure is going to be higher as the density increases. The pressure is going to be higher if the temperature increases as well. Um, and when they come into balance, then that means that those two forces are equal. And so there will be no collapse and no expansion. So if a star is in the process of forming, it's still in the process of collapse, which means that gravity must be being pressure at that point. So the answer to this one, I would say is A. Um, C, when the pressure and gravity are balanced, that will be achieved only at the very end when the star lands on the main sequence. So until then, the protostar, as it's forming <clears throat> the entire time, gravity is being pressure. Okay, so I wanna dive into kind of the specific mechanical details that are happening within a clump of uh, matter that's collapsing. So um, I have this little simulation here um, that illustrates four um, particles that have equal mass. And these arrows are the gravitational forces between each pair of particles. So the length of the arrows indicates the total amount of force um, from each particle on each other particle. The, the arrows are colored by the particle. So for example, particle one, four, and three, each of them are attracted to particle two and that force is indicated by this purple arrow. So um, take a minute and think about this image. I'll give you a little bit longer for this poll. And then I want to know, do you think that gravity is highest when particles are close together or far apart? And therefore, will it be greatest within a low density or a high density clump? Okay, 100% now uh, is saying close together and high density, so gravity is strongest when particles are close together. Uh, and this uh, situation where particles are close together is most likely to occur if there's lots of mass per unit volume, which is a high density. So this is why the highest density clumps are the ones that are more likely to form a protostar. Because if gravity needs to overcome pressure, uh, then you would like to have the highest gravity possible in order to overcome the pressure of a clump. Um, at the same time, though, in order for gravity to beat pressure and start to collapse that clump into a protostar, you also need the pressure to be low, right? And so the temperature needs to be low. So no wonder that this happens within giant molecular clouds because they're very cold. So these dense clumps are located kind of randomly within uh, giant molecular clouds. They're distributed um, just you know, randomly according to chance. And the density of, of various regions is always changing because particles are moving around. Um, and so um, occasionally you might have a, an area that becomes more dense. As it becomes more dense just by chance, if there's sufficient amount of mass in that area, then it can become more and more dense as it continues to gravitationally um, attract. And so as a result, small, um, you know, random fluctuations that increase the density locally in some area can kind of snowball and that can form denser and denser regions and then those eventually collapse into a protostar. So this is the Eagle Nebula. Uh, I think we looked at this last time. So this is supposed to be kind of the Eagle's wings and these towers, um, you know, they have kind of these mini towers that you can see extending off of the tips of them. And then some of these, um, like, I guess, separated regions where it looks like there's kind of little bits of kind of fingers that have separated from the molecular cloud and they're now isolated in space. And these are called evaporating gas globules. Your book doesn't talk about this in huge detail, but um, this is, these are like dense regions that have been uncovered as the cloud is sculpted away by the UV light from nearby stars. So if we look in closer detail, we can see some of these um, evaporating gas globules that are starting to be exposed as the surrounding low density gas is chipped away. And some of these, like there's one out here on the left, um, eventually can become totally separated from that molecular cloud. And even though we can't see them in this image, it's likely that those regions harbor newly forming stars. Um, so these are the high density regions. They have perfect conditions for star formation because they're very cold, 10 to 20 degrees Kelvin, and they have a lot of mass in them. So that's kind of the birthplace of stars, what we would call a stellar nursery. 
And once you have this dense clump of gas and it starts to collapse, um, now the protostar needs to get smaller, hotter, and spin faster. So um, at this point, the, the protostar has a surface. Um, eventually, it, it forms a visible surface um, and becomes opaque to light that tries to escape. So it's emitting light now in the infrared. It basically has what we would call a photosphere, similar to our sun. Um, and it's not um, undergoing nuclear fusion in its core yet, but the heat that's building from gravitational contraction as those particles are getting smashed closer together, um, it, it's being dumped through the surface. Um, and usually there's still a dusty envelope around this star. So like in the previous slide, um, there's likely protostars inside these areas, but we can't see them because of the dust that's still surrounding them. They're emitting in the infrared. So if we look in the infrared instead of the visible, then we can peer through that dust and see through to the forming protostar. Yeah, so if you've ever watched figure skating, then you know the ice skater pulls their arms and legs closer to their body and that causes them to spin up faster and faster. At the same time, like let's imagine that the ice skater was wearing like a necklace, right? That necklace gets pushed outward um, away from the skater's body and this uh, is the same principle that causes the forming star to become rotationally flattened. So this is why the material that's falling into the protostar um, starts to form a disk around it instead of just forming a perfect sphere um, because it's being flattened due to rotation. And any amount of gas that is still out there that's becoming um, you know, gravitationally attracted to the forming star that stuff cannot as easily fall onto the kind of equatorial regions of the disk because it's being pressed outward by the fast rotation. And so it's most likely for material to, to continue falling um, from the polar regions. But eventually that can't happen either uh, because the protostar will form very strong winds. The winds blow away from the polar regions uh, because there's, you know, a lot of material in the disk. So most of those winds are guided out through the polar regions. And um, at this stage, the protostar is almost done. It's almost done forming. It has nearly its final mass uh, because these winds are preventing the material from falling, oops, onto the poles. So now the only way that material can get in is sort of through the um, edges of the disk. And because of the rotation, um, this prevents that material from doing so efficiently. And so this is pretty much the, the final mass of that star. Um, these strong winds are most associated with low mass stars. So higher mass stars don't necessarily go through this phase. So we call this the T tauri phase because that's the first place it was noticed was in a, um, a star called T tauri and the name stuck. And now it's associated with all of the strong stellar wind um, stages of a protostar's formation. All right, so we can then see observational evidence of this T tauri phase. Um, so here's a uh, infrared image over time, and we can see that there's kind of clumps of material that are that's being um, emitted, um, stellar winds being made of particles. So it's blowing particles away from the stellar disk. You can very clearly here see the stellar disk shape, and um, it kind of has a, a mirror image at the bottom. You can see the other um, side of the polar wind um, opposite. So we call the, that a bipolar wind because it's along the two poles of the um, star. The star is spinning at, at this phase. So when I say pole, I mean kind of like the Earth has a North Pole and a South Pole, right? So it's the rotation axis of the star. And eventually these stellar winds will destroy the rest of the disk, which is bad news if you're trying to form planets, I guess. All right, so these particles, high energy electrons and protons, they can um, excite the, any gas that's nearby the system and cause it to glow. So these then are called, um, I don't actually know how to pronounce this, herbig hero objects. And so uh, in these images on the left, you can see kind of glowing regions that are, that's in two directions from a invisible disc. So in the visible, we see the glow from the excited gas, but the disc is, um, still shrouded by dust, and so it's dark. So we can't directly see the protostars in these images for the most part, but we know that they're there because of these telltale uh, 
you know, opposite ended glows. All right, so at long last, um, eventually the temperature will become large enough at the interior of the star or of the protostar to ignite nuclear fusion. This can only happen when the center has reached a million degrees Kelvin. And so at this point, finally fusion begins and now the pressure it will increase. So as fusion begins, temperature increases, the pressure will increase, and that's what stops gravity from continuing to press down. So here, after fusion begins, gravity will continue for a while until um, the star finally reaches hydrostatic equilibrium, and the gravity and pressure will then remain balanced for the rest of its life. All right. Oh, so the... Um, after the star has ignited, it still has a planetary disk around it and planet formation um, may have already begun at this, as at this stage before the star has ignited. Um, and it continues to um, form planets until all of that material has either been turned into a planet or blown away by the stellar wind of the star. So we can see this process directly too, which I think is super cool. So if we look at the infrared region, then we can see the glow from the dust that's left in the disk. And these dark areas are where planets have begun to carve out um, their own location. So the material in that region has been attracted to the planets or, or planetesimals at this point, I guess. And so we see a dark ring wherever a planet has formed. So, you can find tons and tons of images like this on the ALMA website. That's the Atacama Large Millimeter Array. All right, we can also see um, protostars and their protostellar disks in the visible light in certain conditions. So mostly we look in the infrared like the last slide, but sometimes we can see them in the visible only if there's um, light from uh, exterior stars that is um, reflecting off of those disks. So we don't usually see this. Um, and when we do catch them, it's kind of special. They have their own name, which is Proplid, but that's short for, I think, protostellar something. So um, these images are examples in the Orion Nebula where you can actually see the disk only because it's being shined on from some other star. So usually this is hard to, to catch. <laughs>